I think about the church, I have conflicting emotions about her. Uh, the church is God's plan for reaching the world with the love of Jesus, and I love what uh, this can look like on the local level, particularly in our city. I love how beautiful and redemptive the church can be, but it's also hard to ignore the damage and hurt that she's done as well, particularly in these last few years. Between the scandals, the abuse, speaking with hate and anger instead of grace and humility, that damage is deep. I know this breaks the heart of God, but I also know there's more to her than this. The church has been where I've seen marriages healed, addictions broken, lives changed, the hungry fed, the orphan adopted, and hope restored. I think of all the churches and Christ-centered ministries we have in Topeka, they are, they're really trying to work for our city, from mentoring kids to helping families in crisis, dealing with homelessness and mental health challenges. This is church as well. So for me, I think the church is at her best when she's stepping into these hard, messy places with the real help and real hope in the name of Jesus. It's about being a redemptive witness to our city for our Savior. And that redemptive witness starts with you. Yes, you. If you're a follower of Jesus, then you are the church and you are God's plan for reaching the lost in the world. So let's talk about how Jesus saw people. 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 How he saw people as being in the image of God, worthy to be loved and honored, not as an annoyance or an interruption. Let's talk about how Jesus treated people. Let's talk about how he treated them with honor and respect and honesty, even those who didn't believe in him and probably wanted him dead. So let's talk. Let's talk, Topeka. Seven churches with a heart for our city and a desire to be better at being a redemptive witness of Jesus. We come from different backgrounds, different traditions, but we have the same heart to follow Jesus, to live like Jesus together for our city. Seven churches, four stories, of how Jesus loved people and how we can do the same. Let's talk seven churches, four stories of how Jesus loved people and how we can do the same, starting March 9th and 10th.
Hey, welcome to the online community of Fellowship Bible Church. It's really good to have you here as we worship Jesus this weekend. Uh, I realize that some of you are watching from out of state and some of you are traveling or even some of you are homebound. And I just want to let you know, you're welcome here. We're so thankful to have you. And uh, if at any time during the service, you would like to connect with us in any way, just follow the link that's right below me right now in the lower portion of the screen. And uh, it will connect you right to our connection card. And you can fill that out and someone will follow up this weekend with you. So whether you're outside of Topeka or traveling this weekend or even homebound, I think it's really good that you're here and that we can join our hearts and our minds and our voices together in the worship of Jesus. Let's join the service as it begins right now. Cause our God is risen.
Good morning, church. Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Jesus is alive just as he was foretold, and he rose again so that we might be made alive together with him. He has done great things for us, and that's why we're here together to celebrate and give him glory for all that he's done. We want to proclaim together Christ and Christ crucified. Uh, as we're about to start, let's go ahead and try to scoot towards the middle as we have more people coming in, people still trying to come into the parking lot and whatnot. So let's try to make room, make it obvious where the seats are. Uh, it's harder to see when we're all standing together. As we keep going, let's just continue to give God glory for all that he's done in Christ. Broke every curse. Young 
Amen. 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 Let's pray again. Lord Jesus, your name is the great name above every other name. And we're here for you to give you glory and honor for all that you've done. Because you lived, you died, you rose again victorious over sin and death. And you've made us alive together with you. Thank you that none of this rests on our own shoulders. Nothing that we've deserved or earned for ourselves, but by your goodness and your kindness toward us and laying down your own life for our sake. Lord Jesus, you've done it all. So may you receive all the glory in this place because you're worthy. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all you've done. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray together. Amen. Amen. All right, church, say hi to someone around you as you have a seat. risen. So for centuries, the church has greeted each other on Easter morning with that simple call and response. He is risen and he is risen indeed. And when we say it, we join with Christians from generations past and we join with Christians around the globe who are celebrating this same message this weekend. So let's do it one more time. He is risen. Amen. All right. Well, Fellowship Bible Church is a church that exists to help people find and follow Jesus. And one of the ways we do that is by welcoming people. And so we want to welcome you. Whether you are here for the thousandth time or this is your first time, we are so glad that you are here this morning to celebrate our risen Savior. And if you are looking to take a next step of connection or identify yourself, we would love to get to know you. And at the bottom of your worship program, when you came in, there's a spot for a little bit of information. If you would take that and fill it out and stop by the worship center, we would love the worship center. Welcome center. It's fifth service. I can't be held responsible for anything I'm about to say. Welcome center. We would love to get to know your name. We'd love to give you a small gift of appreciation. We are so glad that you're here. And we want to welcome, we want to listen, and then we want to invite you into next steps. And so I just have a couple of invitations for you. And the first is ShareFest. ShareFest is coming up on April 27th, and we're in something like our 18th year of this. And this is just a really fun day where we gather with other churches and we go do landscaping and painting projects all over our city at boys and girls clubs and parks and mostly in schools. And one of the great things about this is you can see what happens on the exterior. You can see a before picture and an after picture, and you can see the efforts and the fruit of your labor. But my favorite thing about ShareFest is as we and other churches have been faithful year in and year out to show up and to do this work, they have begun to trust us in the rest of the year to ask us to come alongside to help, to help solve challenges and to be a part of relationship with them, not just once a year. And that's because we have shown up and so we will ask you to show up for ShareFest. And you can go out in the atrium, you can sign up for a spot and I gotta tell you, if I can do this, you can do it. Because I have no skills, zero but I can be pointed and told to take something over there and I can do it. And if I can do it, you can too. So come join me April 27th. It is actually a ton of fun to serve with one another and it's a great first step into service if you haven't taken one yet. The next step or the next invitation is to come back next week. We're starting a new series next week called Philippians, Joy in the Midst of Suffering. And those are not normally words that we put together, joy, and suffering. But through these four weeks, we're going to see in the writings of Paul how if we are in Christ, we can find joy in the midst of all of the things that life is throwing at us. So we want to invite you to come and to be a part of those weeks. And if you would like to read along in the daily devotional that we've been doing, we have one month left in these devotional books, and we want to offer these books to you free of charge if you want to read Philippians alongside of us. We have a resource table in the atrium, and if 
if you want to stop by there, you can pick one of those up, and we encourage you, read Philippians with us as we dive into that book coming up. Now, before we talk about uh, the message, I want to spend just a moment to talk about generosity, and I thought what I wanted to talk to you guys about today was just my favorite generosity passage in the Bible. And it's found in the book of First Chronicles, and it's not a normal place you'd go to to talk about generosity, but when I look at that story in First Chronicles 29 of King David, I see someone I want to be. King David had called the people to participate in the building of the temple, and they had brought their offerings, and they had done so cheerfully, and when they had done that, he brought them together and he prayed for them, and he said this, who am I? And who are these people that we can give as freely as this? And it is a picture of the man that I want to be. I want to see what God is doing in our city, and I want to see what God is doing in our world, and I want to be a part of it. And that's why I give. And that's why we call you into giving, so that you can take part in what God is doing here and around the world. So we would just ask that you consider that. All right, we are coming up on the last of our four-week series of Let's Talk Jesus And. We've been partnering with six other churches across the city looking at how Jesus treated people. And today we are going to focus on how Jesus treats you as we look at the message of the resurrection. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to gather together as your people here in this location And we're so thankful that you sent Jesus, that he died for us, that he rose from us, and we're gonna celebrate that today. And as we turn to your word, I pray that you would give us eyes to see clearly, that you would give us ears to hear, and that you would change, that we would walk out of here looking more like your son who we're here to celebrate, in whose name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, hey, everyone. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. What a great message that we have on this Easter. This is now our fifth service, and uh, I just wanted to say thank you to all of our parking team, our tech arts team, our whole band who is here in choir. Let's just thank them. And uh, I'm a little bit loopy right now. Someone said hi to me, and I said, Merry Easter. How, how do you explain that one? So hopefully I can hold it together, but I'm really glad you're here. I absolutely love this message. I woke up this morning early for our 7.30 service and was really excited to share it again, and I'm excited to share it with you. It's a message from Jesus, and it's this, never be the same. The good news of the resurrection is that you will never be the same when Jesus is in your life. This is so important for us. Have you ever had a moment where you felt, I may never be the same? Mine was several years ago, and I took my family out to Colorado. We went skiing. And one of my favorite things to do at the time, my sons were, you know, um, in third and fourth grade. Uh, We we would uh, ski down the hills, and that was great, great activity. And then we'd hop on the chairlift and have great dad and son conversations. On one of these trips, though... We looked over at the left and there was one of these freestyle jumps and there's people doing all these different types of things off this jump and, and it was like, wow, that's really cool. But I was riding in a chairlift with a third and fourth grader who looked at me and said, dad, can you do that? What do you say? So I said, sure, I can do that. I mean, not all the flips and everything, but I could go off that jump. Guess what they said? Do it. As soon as they said that, I went, what in the world have I gotten myself into? Oh, my goodness. And so we skied down there, and I said, guys, go to the end of the ramp there, and I'll meet you at the bottom. And they, everything got quiet, and my heart rate started getting up. And I, I came over to the jump, and it was like, oh, my goodness, this is much larger than I thought it was. And looking at it from 200 yards away, what in the world? What am I going to do? I mean, it looked like this, but it felt like this. <laughs> And so I get to the end and I'm all nervous, I'm kind of shaking, and then this dude, a ski dude, comes up behind me and goes, move along, old man. (laughs) My pride was so wounded. But I said, there's no turning back now. So I just kind of pointed my skis down the hill. I go up, off the ramp. That's where everything came unglued. (laughs) The last thing I remember, I was flailing through the air, my ski tips over my head, looking at the Colorado sky and thinking, 
I may never be the same. I did, I had images of rescue helicopters, of ICU waiting rooms with my family there, uh, and, and, and then I hit the ground. And thankfully I hit on my butt, so it kind of broke my fall. Now I did have a bruise, no pictures for that one, but I had a bruise that just lasted for, wait, let's move on from that. I just exploded on the ground and it was, it was like, a, this is a simulated picture, that's not me, but my skis were off, it was a yard sale, and it came, to a halt and everything was still and I felt there and I could feel my legs and I had the wind knocked out of me. My, ski, my kids ski up to me, Dad, are you okay? And I went, yeah, I, I think I'm okay. <laughs> and, and then I looked up and there's the ski lift, the rotisserie of the ski lift going by me. Hey, old man, you okay? You know, all those great moments where I thought I'd never be the same. Now, that was my reality, but it turned out very differently than I thought it would. There are people, people in this room, who navigate life every day from a never the same moment. Something's happened, uh, trauma, uh, an accident, a diagnosis, a death. Life is never the same. Uh, we're a church who wants to listen to stories like this. As we've come alongside Ukrainians living in Topeka who have had a never the same moment, we've started listening to more and more stories to come alongside just to listen and to understand where they're at. One of our friends, Dimitrov, has shared his story. I want you to hear his story of a never the same moment back when the war broke out two years ago. Listen to his story. Hello, Fellowship Bible. My name is Dmitro Pasichnichenko and I am Ukrainian living in Topeka. I was born and lived in Kharkiv, Ukraine, and my own city is the second largest city in Ukraine with population over 1.5 million people. Unfortunately, Kharkiv is located only in 20 miles to the border with Russia, and my own city was a first target during this whole scale war. I have had an inner relationship with God since my young ages, but I cannot say that I often went to church because it seemed that there was always not enough time. But over the past few years, especially since coming to the United States, a lot has changed in my mind and new life priorities have been set. The war in Ukraine began in 2014 when Crimea was annexed and the war in Donbas region started. A war that didn't stop for a single day. Looking at all the years I have lived, I realized that a full-scale war was inevitable. But you can never be ready for that. So the day of the full-scale invasion on 24th of February 2022 changed my life to before and after. My family and I had only one decision. This decision was to leave everything we had to save the most valuable, our lives. The toughest war since World War II is still going on, and since that day, my family and I have left our home and have not had a chance to return. I think that life is about balance in every sphere we have in life. Our way to the USA was very long, but it was here that I felt a miracle happen. I'm talking about balance because we can imagine the scales where on the one side there is the most tragic scene that can happen to humanity, where my family left everything and went into obscurity. And on the other side is all the people who sincerely want to help us and make our lives easier. I am infinitely grateful to our best friend and his family for helping us come here at a time when it was vital. I am grateful to our new friends who welcomed us as a family. Also, we have met a huge number of exceptionally kind people here in the United States and imagine these scales and the two sides, I felt that this is the Lord's plan. I am sure that the Lord's plan works and as a result of this we have a chance to build a new life, a life whose meaning lies in the ability to build relationships with other people and share our kindness. Yeah. So if you just, if you just think about that never the same moment for 
a city 10 times the size of Topeka. Their lives were never the, cha- the same. And some of us are living examples and we could go right to the moment. Life was never the same. I remember just a few years ago when my dad passed and after having all those conversations with my dad, all that relationship, leaving the hospice place where his body was, I just saying, will my life ever be the same in this area? You know, when Jesus died, when he was put into a grave, that's exactly what his disciples, exactly what his followers felt. Will our lives ever be the same? We left everything to follow this master. We, we, we started learning from him. We thought he would, we thought he would give us position. We thought we would give uh, the rightful place in Israel. But no, he's lost. He's, he's in the grave. He's dead. Until John chapter 20. If you have your Bibles, open up there with me because you're going to see a never the same moment in their lives. And as we go here to the Bible, I just want to tell you, this is not just what other people's experienced in the first century on that first Resurrection Sunday. This is something that's for you. Because their experience, John is sharing this, not so that we just see it and understand it, but that we too would also see Jesus for who he is and believe in him. So I just wanted to let you know, Fellowship Bible Church is here to help people find and follow Jesus Christ. And he's the reason we're here. And here's the reason we're gonna be talking about that. And under this whole picture of how, what the Bible presents us as Jesus, we're gonna be calling you into a relationship with him. Now, in this first century, eyewitnesses, they're going to show us a few things that really made it a never the same moment in their lives. And John is gonna share from, from the empty tomb to the grave clothes that Jesus was was wrapped in, to the risen physical appearance of Christ, and then the fulfilled promise of Christ, that his words were authenticated because of his works. So let's look at each one of these. First of all, we come in in John chapter 20, verse 1. There's an empty tomb. John focuses on Mary, Mary Magdalene, uh, a close follower of Jesus. She arrives at the tomb and the stone is rolled away. And she doesn't know what to do with that. She looks in and doesn't see the body. So one of the first things she makes is probably the first conclusion I would make. Someone stole the body. She looked in, it says here, that uh, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She runs, she goes and tells the disciples. They don't know what to do with this news. So guess what they do? They do what I do. They run to the tomb and see with their own eyes. That's exactly what you have. You have Peter and John running to the tomb and this is how John presents this experience. This is the grave clothes. Now I should, should tell you that it was customary according to Jewish law that when someone died, you would bury them the same day they died. And this was an interesting thing because Jesus was from Nazareth but he's in Jerusalem. You couldn't transport the body, so someone had to bury it. And that's where we get in John chapter 19. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy Jewish man, bought a tomb, a tomb where nothing had ever been laid in it, and gave it to Jesus. And his followers came, and and they they wrapped the body from the neck down in strips of linen. Not like a mummification kind of thing where the body is preserved, but they would wrap it with strips of linen and tuck in between those strips spices and oils so that the rotting body wouldn't smell as it did that. And over the course of the year, it would, it would deteriorate into bones. And then they would take those bones and they'd put them in a bone box and put them in a niche inside that tomb. So every family had a tomb like that. And, and Jesus had this tomb that a body had never been placed in and his body was wrapped in those, in those strips of, of linen and this is what happens. John arrives, he gets there first. He's stooping to look, that word look in the Greek is blepe and it really means just to glance. You know when you walked into church and saw a bunch of people, you blepeed them, you just kind of glanced at them, right? That's what John did. He looked in the tomb. The body's not there, but he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Then it says, look at verse six. 
Simon Peter came following him. John wrote this, so it's, I think it's kind of interesting. It's the classic, I am faster than you are statement <laughs> wrapped up in this story. But he went into the tomb. Peter actually goes into the tomb. So he goes into the tomb and he looks there. Look what it says. He saw, that's another word. There's another Greek word. It's called theri. And it's where we get this English word theory. It's where he tries to make sense of what is before his eyes. He sees the same linen cloth lying there, the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. This shows, this is again, just an eyewitness account. Body wasn't stolen. Who would, who would leave the grave clothes in a perfect condition there? Most scholars who read this believe that the body literally passed through the grave clothes. So it was more like a cocoon of strips of linen. But he saw, but he didn't understand. And then look at verse eight. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, he also went in and he saw, that Greek word is idon, and believed. In other words, that word for seeing it was, I get it, I get it. It was a never the same moment. I didn't understand before, now I get it, and I never see, I, I don't see it the same anymore. I, I used to not understand it, now I do. That's what he's talking about. He saw it, and he believed. So he goes back, he's go, he goes back, and they go and tell the disciples that, they, uh, that the body wasn't there. Jesus must be risen. But then Jesus appears himself. Do you know he, who he first appeared to? It was Mary Magdalene. And she's weeping at the tomb. And she's wondering, where have they put the body of the Lord Jesus? By the way, in a culture where a woman was not given the right to make a testimony, the word of God puts a woman right at the center of the testimony of the life of Christ. Do you see what's happening? It's, it's no one's, Everyone is invited into this story. Male and female are invited into this story. And when Jesus appeared to her, she went back and reported, I have seen the Lord. She saw the risen Lord. And she went and reported that to the disciples. And they said, nah, I don't think so. But then Jesus appears to them. And they say, we have seen the Lord. And then Thomas. Thomas wasn't with the disciples. He was the only one not in that room. But eight days later, Jesus appears before Thomas and he says, my Lord and my God. There was a difference. There was a never the same moment. He went from, he went from questions to confident. And he didn't just call him a man that was risen. He goes, my Lord and my God. He worshiped Jesus as God. This was a never the same moment because of the risen Christ. Empty tomb, grave clothes, risen Christ, and then... And then you have the fulfilled promise. As John shares the testimony about Jesus, the good news about Jesus, he introduced him back in chapter 11 with one of the great I am statements, the identity statements of Jesus, where Jesus said before he raised Lazarus from the dead, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And he asked that question, do you believe this? That question that he asks when he raised Lazarus, everyone said, wow, he has the power to do that. But on Easter morning, when he actually rose from the dead, he truly is the resurrection and the life. It happened in his own life. He has the power over sin and death. So therefore, John writes in verse 31 of chapter 20, these things are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you would have life in his name. See, it wasn't just a story of a man who was dead but is now alive. It's a story of God in the flesh who lived a perfect life. He died a final death, and he rose again on the third day to prove, to prove that this is who God is. We had a God who didn't wait in heaven for us to perform and work our way back to him. Most of the religions of the world are built around this simple principle, be good. Just be good. How many messages have you heard in churches that says, God is good, you are bad, be good. We'll see you next week. That's all about what I'm doing. 
And biblical Christianity has been, is all based on what's been done for you in Christ. So the invitation of the fulfilled promise is that when you come to Jesus, you stop trying. You stop trying to do more and you rest in the work that he has given you. That's too good a deal, isn't it? You can't hold people hostage to performing. You're in, you're out because you did, because you didn't. No, you can't. That's not biblical. The reality of that is that's why Jesus had to come is because we couldn't, because we don't, because we won't. But he did, and he will. And he provides eternal life and forgiveness of sins to anyone who believes in him. But it's not you saving yourself. It's you trusting in him to save you. That fulfilled promise is that promise that again just revealed his words were authenticated by his works. The empty tomb, the grave clothes, the risen Christ, the fulfilled promise. But then there was something else that happened. And these are what I would call the internal or the personal realities. Each person had a personal encounter with this reality. In other words, it wasn't just a creed that the church would say. This was a personal experience that people would have with the risen Christ. And I would say this. This happened, as John wrote in verse 31, so that you might believe. So ultimately what John is saying is you need to have that personal encounter with Jesus, the risen Savior, Jesus himself. And these internal realities of these first eyewitnesses in the first century are still a pattern for us in the 21st century. And the first one is this. They each had their never be the same moment. Where they went from fear and being scared and being scattered all around Jerusalem to ultimately when Jesus appeared to them and they believed and they put their faith in him, they became a united force of people who would believe in Jesus and their hearts were radically changed and their lives were transformed to take this message to the end of the earth. They had their never be the same moment. With Mary, the one we met in the earlier part of chapter 20, it's when Jesus called her name. She originally thought he was a gardener, but then it says this, Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbi or Rabboni, which, which means teacher. In other words, his word to her, his identifier to her was her name. That means that we have a personal God who is calling us back into a relationship with him. Hers was very personal, and she turned back, and she got it, and she believed, and she never was the same. With the disciples, it was interesting. They didn't take Mary's testimony as fact. And so Jesus actually appears before them in verse 19. It says, peace be with you, he says to them. And we had said this, what does he do? He shows them his hands and his sides. And it says this, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now, in my English version of the word here, the word is glad. And I just don't think glad packs a punch. So I went back to the, to the original reading of this in the Greek, and it meant overjoyed. It meant they rejoiced. They, they had that moment. Oh my goodness, it's him. It's him. He really is who he said he was, and he did what he said he would do. This is Jesus. They were overjoyed with that. And then with Thomas. Thomas, again, had all his questions. He said, unless I put my hands in his hand and fingers in his side, I will never believe. See that? How many of us are like this with Jesus? Until I see it, I'm not going to believe it. Well, that's exactly the pattern. It's not any different in the first century as it is from the 21st century. We like to see it before we believe it. So Jesus appears to him. And he says the same thing he said to the disciples. Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Thomas, just put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand. Place it in my side. And then he says to Thomas, do not disbelieve, but believe. Disbelieve, but believe. I love that, how the Greek sounds in it. It takes me back to going to church with my grandma uh, in the Greek Orthodox Church. It sounds like this. Apistos, alapistos. Can you say that with me? Apistos, alapistos. You now know Greek. You're all scholars. But I love that. It's, a, it's a, from a position, of, it's a position of disbelief and distance to belief and reconciliation back with Jesus. That's that never be the same moment, and they never were the same. Have you had a never be the same moment with Jesus? 
where you may have heard about him from a distance. You may have even seen people who have identified as followers of Jesus but lived very radically different lives than Jesus. But we all have to come to that moment where we ask, what are we gonna do with Jesus? What do I do with Jesus? And the beauty of this message is that the God of the universe invites you into a relationship with him through Jesus. It's because Jesus lived for you. It's because Jesus died for you. It's because Jesus rose for you that you can be a part of a relationship with God again. You can have a never the same moment. Now, fellowship is all about, again, helping people find and follow Jesus Christ. And we're always going to talk to you about where are you with that. As we welcome uh, hundreds of people on the weekend to, to this news, each weekend, we always like to listen at where they're at. And we like to hear where they're at, because wherever they're at, we always like to invite them into their next step with Jesus. What does that look like? So if they're closed, we just pray that they become curious. If they're curious, we pray that they become a seeker. If they're seeking him, we pray that we find, that they find him. And if they found him, we want them to follow him. We call people right where they're at. And you'll find that wherever you're at on that, you're not alone. There's a segment of fellowship that's in each one of those categories. I want to introduce you to one of the stories of, of someone here at our church. Her name is Catherine, and she's going to share her story, her never the same moment. Listen to her. Hi, I'm Catherine. I am loud and bubbly and energetic. I'm also very type A, just a little OCD and a high achiever. I grew up in a Christian home and from the outside, I was always a good little Jesus loving girl. Um, I was good at keeping a very structured exterior, um, but my interior didn't always match what people were seeing. I always was a good kid and made all the right choices. I was a bit of an actress, so playing the part of a Christian came pretty easy to me. Time moved on and I continued my charade and I married my high school sweetheart and he moved us to Florida to continue his studies at the University of Florida. And while we were in Florida, I worked as a nurse on the bone marrow transplant unit. And if you don't know anything about that type of unit, you come into contact with a serious amount of death. I remember that one month we lost 12 souls to cancer. I didn't have very much experience with losing people. Um, to say that I struggled was an understatement. I started confronting some very real questions about life and death and God, really. Questions like, is God good? And if he's good, how? And even things like, is heaven real? With those questions and my husband's guidance, we started attending a church. We got involved in a small group and I started meeting with an accountability partner. During those accountability meetings, I was able to get some answers to those questions, but also I got led into more questions. She led me to God's word and she prayed with me. By the grace of God, I came to know Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. I fell in love with who he is and I believed his promises about what he said about life and about death. So now I can boldly say, death, where is your sting? I love that story because it kind of shows you what has to happen in each of us with the message that some of us can pretend to be and can pretend to do, but ultimately when something hits us that we can't overlook and to have Jesus respond to that and to have the gospel make sense in that so that an authentic relationship with Jesus can happen, I mean, that's that never be the same moment. And it's our prayer that everyone in this room has that moment with Jesus. And so we wanna encourage you wherever you're at to consider your relationship with Christ. One of the things we've been doing over the course of this weekend, we've been doing baptisms after. Now, baptisms don't save you. We don't believe there's anything mystical in the water or anything, but it's a physical representation of an internal reality. And so when we dip you under the water, we say your life is now paired with the death of Christ. He died for you, and everything he accomplished on the cross is yours. And then we go, and then we rise. We eventually bring you up, okay? <laughs> we bring, bring them up and go, but you're now alive to God through Jesus Christ. And we say you're paired with his resurrection. 
and different people this weekend. It's just been fascinating. Last night, we were hearing young stories and older stories of people who've given their life to Christ and they've had that moment. I had one guy go, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, even though at one time he was at a distance from me and I I held him at a distance. I just came because my wife came here and he hung around and started asking deeper questions and different relationships, just like what happened with Catherine, different relationships of people sharing with you that made it real. And he got opened his eyes and his heart to the reality of everything Christ had done for him. And he believed that. Once people believe though, our lives are transformed. You know, there's this thought, there's this thought, especially here in our country, our country of hyper-individualism and personal rights that Jesus is in my life to make me good, that Jesus serves me, and he better do things as I want him to. So I pray in order for him to do the things I want him to do. And the reality of the resurrection is Jesus is a little bit greater than you are, like a lot, like he's Lord. He's not your life coach. He's Lord over heaven and earth. And so there's going to be change. Here's the change that's gonna happen. You're gonna be liberated from your obsession of yourself and you're gonna be changed and transformed to look more and more like Jesus. That is, my friends, something that has given me the greatest joy in my walk with Christ is that it can't be about me anymore. I can't be at the center of my life. I don't live anymore for me. I live for Jesus. And that has totally, radically changed my heart for him and for people around me. I'm no longer selfish, well, in most cases, and I'm no longer self-righteous thinking I'm better than other people. The gospel has melted my heart so that I humbly can see Jesus for who he is and I can follow him. That is going to be transformation. And you look in the disciples' lives, again, John is writing these things so that once we believe, he says this, that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the name you live for. It's got to be more and more about Jesus. Now, the older I get in life, I just realize I've had it with me. I don't need more of myself. Over the course of my walk with Christ, I've just seen I've needed more of Jesus in me and Jesus through me. And that's what the church is. It's people's lives who aren't perfect. Man, we are messed up. Just hang out with us for a little while. We are messed up, but we follow someone who's perfect. And we ask him to change us and transform us, to make him loving, make make us loving, to make us more forgiving like Christ has forgiven us, to break our hearts for the situations going on in the world right now, that we would be people who would live the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they had that never be the same moment. Their lives were transformed. But here's the other one. The message of the resurrection was their mission. In the same way that the first person who saw Jesus went to the disciples and said, I have seen the Lord and everything he told her. In the same way that that was happened, Jesus came to the disciples and said this, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. In other words, folks, this is a message that shouldn't stay in church, okay? We say this over and over here, that this is not a church. You are the church, Because the church is people, priceless, eternal people who've been changed by the person and the work of Jesus Christ and go out and live and give that change in the world around us. This is really key for us. So we go to give this message. And I just think about all the potential in this room of those of you who believe in Jesus, that as your lives are transforming, I think about all the people God is going to place in front of you this week people who work around you, people who live around you, people who drive around you, okay? Even out of the parking lot today, okay? People who live around you for you to share the goodness and the greatness of Jesus, to make his name greater on earth as it is in heaven. This is that mission that we were called to. And it is something, again, that John would write in his first epistle in 1 John 1, verse 3. He said, that which we have seen. He saw the resurrected Christ. That who he heard, peace be with you, I proclaim also to you. This is a message 
that we shouldn't keep inside. This isn't a message that just makes our lives more comfortable. This is a message that now puts us only, not just at peace with God, but on purpose with God. The God of the universe will partner with you to advance the gospel of Jesus to the ends of the earth. Some people, when they hear it, will not believe. Others will. It's not up to you to save people. You don't save people. That's God's work. We just have to be faithful with this message. Folks, it's a message that was based on external realities and the internal change of people who first saw it. And it continues today. The grave still is empty. The grave clothes have long since disappeared. The risen Christ is still alive and reigning in heaven. His promises are true. And you will never be the same when you put your life in his hands. Would you stand with me as we close? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your church that you have gathered together today to get our minds and our hearts around this great message that Christ is alive. He's risen from the dead. And we see it, we get it, and now, Lord, we ask for you to help us to give it, to live in such a way that reflects more of Jesus and less of ourselves, that gives the gospel away to others who are searching for longing and longing to be restored back to God. Lord, use us, the church, to reflect the goodness and greatness of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church.